Good evening, everyone. We're still a couple of minutes away from starting, but that was the beautiful music of Francesca, of, of um, Gemma Rosefield, uh, with the piano of uh, <coughs> ben, Benjamin Nabarro, uh, which was recorded especially for this evening in Gemma's own studio. It was to be um, recorded in the hall at JW3. Mm -hmm. And then they announced lockdown, and lo and behold, we had to move to we being uh, out of the building again to all intents and purposes. Um, so uh, I have another piece which, uh, which uh, Gemma recorded for us, which I will play at the end of this evening. Um, so good evening and welcome to this very special event. Our first Crystal Nacht commemoration on Zoom. We're now eight months into uh, having all our events and classes and courses and commemorations and celebrations online. Um, and we've been amazed at how well these things work and how, um, how we can still connect as a community, how we can still be together, how we can share the ups and the lows of our lives um, in lockdown in isolation and just not being together um, and the JW3 community has built up to be one of huge strength and I know this from the amazing feedback you send me uh, which has been so uplifting for those of us that are working so hard to keep all this going for you. Um, there are people on this call from all over the world and people I don't know. So apologies for not having introduced myself. I'm Judy Troshire, Head of edu Education, Adult Education at JW3 um, in the building in Swiss Cottage and now online. 
Uh, this evening has been made even more possible, and especially for that music, the beautiful music we just heard, by uh, the Genesis Philanthropy Group, to whom we are very, gen very grateful for their generous support. They've supported many events, and especially our Holocaust education ones over the last few years. And in fact, going back to the London Jewish Cultural Centre, where Trudy also ran these and spoke at these Holocaust education commemorative events. So um, this evening we have this a keynote from Trudy and it's such an honor again to have you here Trudy, thank you so much. I doubt there's anyone, anybody on this call who has not heard Trudy before or heard of Trudy. She's an internationally world-renowned educator on Holocaust, anti-racist issues and history. And we're honored and proud to have her as part of the JW3 family. Trudy, thank you so much for doing this evening and over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Judy, for everything you've done for everyone and held it all together. So a special thank you to, to you. And of course, tonight is a solemn night. I was speaking to my friend Anita Lasker-Wolfish before I came on air. Um, she is one of the few people that I know personally who remembers Kristallnacht 82 years ago, the night of the 9th of 10th November, 1938. 15 years since the failed putsch, also the anniversary of the birth of Martin Luther. And that was the night, it's called the night of the broken glass. And it's particularly important to commemorate because it is the first state organized pogrom in Nazi Germany. Now, it's very difficult when one is putting on a commemorative event, because what we're trying to do is to honor the dead, to talk about the events that led up to it, but it should also be a manruf, it should also be a warning cry for the future. And one of the issues that I am finding most troublesome at the moment, one would have thought that post Shoah, we would have learned some lessons. I'm just praying that there are enough people now who understand the enormity of the appalling events that happened because as the great Yehuda Bauer said, there have been 16 genocides post-World War II. When are we ever going to learn? When are we ever going to see the warning signs? And it was the great Yehuda Bauer who said, perhaps history should turn over to psychology because unless we come to grips with the human condition, how on earth are we going to do anything to prevent these appalling things happening again? So. I'm asking you to do two or three things tonight. The first is to honor the dead, to honor those whose lives were destroyed. The second is to listen to the events that led up to it. And the third, I guess, is to say, well, what on earth can we do? Because all it takes for evil to succeed, this is a very famous statement, is for good people to step aside and tragically, that is exactly what happened after Kristallnacht, before Kristallnacht, and what happened in Nazi Germany and in Europe. So, during those terrible attacks, 267 synagogues were burnt, destroyed by fire. 7,000 businesses were destroyed. Hospitals were attacked across Austria and Germany, because please don't forget March 1938, Hitler had gone home, the Anschluss. 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and taken to concentration camps. 91 were murdered that terrible night, but a further 638 died of maltreatment, torture or suicide. One of the most terrifying aspects of this terrible tragedy is the number of people committed suicide. The following day, all Jewish children were banned from schools. All Jewish communal organizations were finally disbanded. And then the Jewish community was fined a million marks. Now that is a billion marks, which is about $5.5 billion in money today. About 20% of all the remaining Jewish property was confiscated and all insurance claims for Kristallnacht were paid to the Nazi state. And who perpetrated it? Paramilitaries the SA and of course civilians, but it was very much under the auspices of Joseph Goebbels and function of the Nazi state. And also because many of the local Gauleiters were short of money, 
there was always avarice, greed and politics coming together. This is a report from the Times, the 11th of November. Never forget, all the Western press was in Germany. Up until 1939, after 39, the American press were there until Pearl Harbor. You could read about these events in any British newspaper. This is the Times. No foreign propaganda bent on blackening Germany before the war could out before the world could outdo the tale of burnings and beatings of blackguardy assaults on defenseless and innocent people which disgraced that country yesterday. Goebbels, this is what Goebbels said. This is, this is his big speech. Pull back the police. The Jews for once should feel the anger of the people. And then burnings of the synagogues are permitted only if there's no danger of fire in the neighborhood. Foreigners must not be molested, even if they are Jews. That was from the Minister of Culture. And this is a report of the New York Times. There was scarcely a Jewish shop, cafe, office or synagogue that was not either wrecked, burnt or seriously destroyed. And before synagogues, demonstrators stood with pear books from which they tore out the leaves. And there's a lot of footage of this. The, camera were, the cameras were there. So this is a pogrom that is widely, this is widely known. Now, my question, how did the, how did arguably the best educated, most cultured nation in the world sink to this? And it's important to remember that Nazism was not a political creed. It was worshipped with the kind of love that you worship a political, that you worship a religious figure. The late, great Robert Wistrich said that Hitler became the evil messiah. He was worshipped as one would worship a messiah. And also, those of us who put our faith in education, the largest membership of the Nazi party was actually in the teaching, medical and legal professions. When the final solution was written down at Wannsee, when 16 heads of departments in a, in a business meeting came together at Wannsee, except it wasn't a business meeting, because they were talking about the murder of a third of our people. Two thirds of them had law degrees. The majority had PhDs from top German universities. When you talk about the killing squads, the Einsatzgruppen, of the 3000 SS officers who followed the German army into Russia and murdered one and a half million people, men, women, and children, with the help of a lot of locals, police, and the Wehrmacht, the majority of them had PhDs from top German universities. Now, and at the core of the Nazi ideology was the Jewish question. Building on a long tradition of, theodor of theological hatred, the Nazis themselves, the inner circle were pagan, but never forget the majority of people who voted for Adolf Hitler were Christian. And in Germany, you had the Catholic position on anti-Judaism. Never forget, it wasn't until, nine, until the early 60s that the Catholic Church forgave the Jews for all time for the sin of deicide, but they still blamed the Jews of their generation. Now, and Luther, with Lutheranism, Protestant Lutheranism, you, if you, you, all you have to do is read Luther's pamphlet on the Jews and their lies, where basically, he talks about the destruction of the synagogues, the burning of the Talmud and their expulsion. So from both branches in Germany, you have a strong theological tradition of hatred. But what is, what is different about Nazism? Christianity, although for centuries it said that the Jews should be downgraded, they should live, in, they should live witness to the true faith of Christianity, they never said murder them all. What has changed with Nazi ideology is the Jew becomes the center, the scapegoat. All the ills of Germany are pushed on that population that only makes up 1% of the, actually 1% of Germany, that's all, a tiny population. But the other issue is of course, Jews had had a very high pro visibility profile in Germany. So after the horrific defeat at the end of the First World War, when I say defeat, not necessarily military defeat, but economic, social and political defeat, a scapegoat was needed. And certainly Hitler and his inner circle really did believe that the Jews were the evil ones in, 
in power. Now, when Hitler first came to power in 1933, when he was voted into power, the totally non-democratic Hitler, after trying for a putsch in 1923 and going to jail for it, he then does it through the democratic process. By 1933, he has enough power in the state and enough support from vested interests to take 44% of the vote. And then with a further 8% from very right wing parties, nationalist parties and aristocratic parties, he takes power. By the end of 1933, there is no other political power in Germany. So when he bans all other parties, the majority of German Jews, when Hitler came to power, were fully integrated into both the cultural, political and economic life of the country. They define themselves as German. This is one of the great tragedies of German Jewry. More than any other group, Jews working in the German language, they were German. Heine, the great German Jewish poet, Heinrich Heine, he said, in the end, it is the tragic love affair. I mean, intermarriage in Weimar was the highest in the world. It was running at 45%. So what it tells us, there were liberal Germans who were intermarrying with Jews. There was, it was the Janus face of Germany. On one level, it was Goethe and Schiller and Bach and Beethoven, to quote that famous truism, but on the other, it was racism. It was, it was strong nationalism in, and militarism. So you had these two forces. Anyway, Jews had been granted full, em full emancipation in 1871, and they were a very, very important part of German life. They were, if I use the phrase, they were at the sharp edge of modernity. This is, it, to quote Isaiah Berlin, imagine a people from another planet and they land on planet Earth, and it is the most wondrous planet they've ever seen. And back on their own planets, they have a great tradition of learning and they fall in, fall in love with the society they see. They fall in love with its art, its architecture, its music. They see all the opportunities as outsiders and because they have this traditional of learning and they gravitate into law and medicine. You know, by 1933, 50% of the lawyers and 50% of the doctors in Berlin were Jewish. 8% of the population of Berlin, 1% throughout the country. Economics, physics, the greatest physicist in the world was Albert Einstein, the head of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, Fritz Haber, who had created the Haber-Bosch process. They were all born Jews. Now, the point about Nazism, it didn't matter whether you converted or saw yourself as an internationalist. For the Nazis, it was about the taint of Jewish blood. So Jews were in liberal politics, they were in left-wing politics, the new sciences in particular, 80% of the businesses in department stores, Cadeve, Wertheim, the Hotel Adlon, the Kempinski chain, the film industry attracted them in droves. I mean, if you think of some of the characters who later on really gloried Hollywood, people like Fritz Lang, and later on Otto Preminger, etc. This and the, the greatest theatre director in the whole of Europe who had theatres in Berlin and in Vienna was of, was of course Jewish. So consequently, you have this incredible explosion of culture. They wore their Jewishness very lightly. Only about 10% of the population was actually Orthodox. And the majority of the others, as I said, they were acculturated Germans. It was Nazi race theory that imposed their Jewishness on them. And between 1933 and 1939, Nazi policy was social, political, and economic exclusion from Germany. What the Nazis wanted was a Juden Reich. In 1933, I've already mentioned the Career Civil Service Act. The Career Civil Service Act threw the Jews out of the professions. It's true, Einstein lost his job. All the scientists who were born Jewish had to leave, whether they'd been converted or not. 32 laws passed in that one year. And it begins on April the 1st, 33, with a boycott of all Jewish businesses. Stormtroopers at the gates terrorizing the Jewish, the Jewish shop owners or those who had medical practices, but also terrorizing any German who still wanted to do business with them. Now, so teachers lost their jobs, professors lost their jobs. And ironically, this is, it's fascinating, something like 3000 German scientists got out and many of them really changed the face 
of British science and American science. Jews are gradually excluded from the cultural life of Germany. It takes time. In 1933, no more Jews into the legal profession. But it took till 37, they had to train up the Aryans. Jews are not allowed, when I use the term Aryan, remember it's in inverted commas, I can't go with race theory. There is no such thing as a pure race, unless you want to talk about geographical uh, isolation for 2000 years. I guess you could make a case for the Maori. You might make a case for the Eskimo, but certainly what the Nazis, it's all about bloodline. So as far as Jewish doctors are concerned, it's not until 37, they can no longer practice and Jewish lawyers because it's taken time to bring the others up to speed. And it's in 35 that Jews are finally deprived of citizenship under the Nuremberg laws, the cheering in the absolute cheering in the Reichstag, and also Jewish intermarriage was forbidden. Intermarriage becomes a crime in Nazi Germany because, and sexual relation between Jew and Aryan becomes a crime. Why? Because this is the pollution of the bloodline. Jewish blood is strong. And against this backdrop, Remember, Goebbels had taken over as the Reich's Minister of Propaganda, arguably the propaganda genius of the 20th century. He used every modern means to promote the image of the Fuhrer. He was responsible for every book that was read in Germany. He was responsible for the core curriculum. He was responsible for every film that was shown on German cinema, the radio. He controlled what people thought. And something else. If you, if, if you protested, what happened to you? Well, there was Dachau, the first concentration camp that was actually 12 miles from, from Munich. And it was established on April the 1st, 1933. It was on the front page of the Times. Now, as far as the Jews were concerned, by 1935, about a third of them had got out. But nobody could have predicted what was to come. And in addition, since 1929 and the Wall Street crash, it was very difficult to get visas. So, and the level of anti-Semitism was up throughout Europe and America. Can you imagine just how dark the 30s were? You had the Spanish Civil War, Mussolini in Italy, Stalin in Russia, France, a more or less divided country. Even in America, where you have Father Coughlin, the rabble-rousing anti-Semite, characters like Lindbergh, you know, the great hero, characters like Henry Ford, so, and the German Bund of five million people. So in Germany itself and in England, although England in the end went for a government of national unity, please don't forget Mosley's black shirts. Don't forget the Friday Club. Don't forget how many British aristocrats really thought, well, at least Hitler's has come is going for the law and order and it's going to stop communism so Europe in the 30s was a very very dark place and you have this situation where even if you want to get out how are you going to get out and there's no Albert Einstein had no problems he could have gone to Oxford or Cambridge he finished up in Princeton people with high qualifications or people with a lot of money but how bad, after the Nuremberg laws, some Jews thought, well, this is as bad as it's going to get. What if they didn't have the language? What if they had parents to look after or young children? Why don't people leave? Now, you know, there's a very interesting quote on anti-Semitism by the great Isaiah Berlin. On the subject of anti-Semitism, before the war, we were sleepwalkers, now we are insomniacs. We know what happened. Remember, they don't know how bad can it be? How bad can it get? And also the sole agony of giving everything to culture in Germany. I'll never forget, um, I once had the privilege of chairing a very good discussion with two German Jews who became incredibly important in British society. And I'm not gonna tell you his name, but he suddenly said, you do realize I came from the land of culture to the land of the barbarians. And then he said, my goodness, did I really say that? Look, every small town had its opera house. Every small town had its music. Even Nathan Goldman, who later became head of the World Jewish Congress, he was a German Jew. He said, even in 1939, if someone had asked me to imagine the death camps, I couldn't. 
you needed to have the soul of a Dante to imagine the inferno. Today, we know what's possible. And in many ways, I think that what makes us as a species even more complicated and problematic. The fact that we know what's possible, we, we know what happens, we see it. And the question is, what can the individual do about it? And then there was a lull because Germany hosted the Olympics. And the, with the attention of the world focused on Berlin, what you have is the lessening of the outward signs of prejudice, like the park benches, Jews cannot sit here. There was a kind of lull. But then in 37, it's ratcheted up again. Hitler's got full employment now, and he wants more and more of Jewish money. You see, what does a Judenreich Reich, Reich mean? It means getting the Jews out of Germany. 37, the Aryanization of property. You've got a business. You've got to sell it now to an Aryan. I remember the head of the Wannsee House, who was a friend of mine, German, married to an Israeli psychiatrist. He said, if Germany had paid full reparations, it would have been bankrupt. The Aryanization of business meant that thousands are impoverished. And as a measure of further humiliation, they have to add the name Sarah or Israel to all Jewish papers. And it had to be stamped with the J, Yuda. By 1938, despite all the quotas, over half of German Jewry had managed to get out. And as I said before, those who made it to Britain and America would put a light under British and American culture at every level, whether it be the creation of high culture or popular culture. Just think about America, think about Hollywood, think about the American songbook. Cole Porter said he was the only American composer who wasn't a Jew. And if you want to think fun, because once in a while we have to, just think of Irving Berlin, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. He wasn't German, but you need to look at the German contribution, the German and Austrian Jewish contribution to the American film industry, to the British film industry. They set a light under everything. I mean, my friend Anita Laskavalfish, who played for Mengele, can you imagine in Auschwitz? What did she do when she came to this country? She founded the English Chamber Orchestra. They were unbelievable. They are an unbelievable generation. And of course, the situation is made worse because in, on March the 15th, 1938, Hitler goes back home to Austria, the Anschluss. You know, after the war, the Austrians performed such a marvelous trick. They managed to prove they were the first victims of Nazism. What if I tell you that in 1919, they asked for Anschluss after the First World War and the defeat of the Habsburg Empire. All you have to do is look at the footage. 10% of the population of Vienna was Jewish. 90% was German Austrian and they were on the streets screaming for Hitler. It was absolutely extraordinary. And now you have the 200,000 Jews of Austria are now under Nazi control. And the situation is becoming so bad that James P. MacDonald, who's the Commissioner for Refugees at the League of Nations, the League of Nations had been set up at the end of the First World War to stop conflict. Ironically, two of the greatest refugees in history, Einstein and Freud, went into debate on what causes war. But it was a completely ineffectual body. But nevertheless, under pressure from Roosevelt, they set up a conference at Evian, which is on the shores, it's on the, it's on the border between France and Switzerland. A very cynical colleague of mine said, all you've got to do is take the word Evian, turn it upside down and it spells naive. And it was to discuss the plight of, Ger of, of German and Austrian Jewry. Now, Gold in My Ear was the representative and so was Abba Iban. We know what happened at Evian. And in the end, there were 32 countries assembled. They spent most of their time on the golf course and the conference was summed up by the Australian delegate, a man called Lieutenant Colonel T.E. White. He said, we are not desirous of importing a race problem. We don't have one yet. Only the Netherlands and Denmark agreed to temporarily relax quotas. The Dominican Republic offered to take 100,000 in order to settle undeveloped land, but that came to nothing. 
the British representative, Lord Winterton, when he went back to London, he sent a note to Ribbentrop, later hanged as a war criminal at Nuremberg, and who was probably the lover of Mrs. Simpson. She, he used to send her roses every, every weekend. He actually apologized for the unwarrantable interference in the affairs of a sovereign state. It's Hitler stated before the conference, this is what he said, I can only hope that the other world, which has such deep sympathy for these war criminals, would at least be generous enough to convert sympathy into practical aid. Now, basically, this is what, this is what gave Hitler the nod. This is what the, the Allies made lots of notes of sympathy, but they didn't do anything. This is an extract from the Sunday Express. This is June the 19th, 1938. This is in advance of the Evian Conference. The British press, the French press, the Belgian press were full of it. And I should mention that the right-wing French government was, all, was already playing with the idea of sending all Eastern European Jews to Madagascar. Now, this is the article of the Express. In Britain, half a million Jews find their homes. They are never persecuted. And indeed, in many respects, the Jews are given favored treatment here. But just now there's a big influx of foreign Jews into Britain. They are overrunning the country. They are trying to enter the medical profession in great numbers. They wish to practice as dentists. Worst of all, many of them are holding themselves out to the public as psychologists. A psychologist needs no medical training, but arrogates to himself the functions of a doctor and he often attains an ascendancy over the patient of which he makes base use if he is a bad man. The hostility to the Jews in Germany cannot be condoned, but beware lest the present rush of Jews into this country injures the cause of Jewry here, for professional men naturally prevent their living being taken from them by immigrants from foreign countries, whether they be Jew or Gentile. There is no intolerance in Britain today. It's extraordinary. And this is the kind of tone of the article. And I should also mention, um, after the war, after the war was declared, of course, many Jew German Jews were interned. And after the invasion of Belgium, I don't know if you know this, but there was an extraordinary incident in Hampstead, where Jews were German and Austrian Jews were arrested in Heath Street. And the police surrounded Hampstead Library and arrested 13 intellectuals. I mean, this is what it's come to. And of course, there was one man who did find refuge in England amongst many. And that man was, of course, Sigmund Freud. Now, Freud had been taken into Gestapo headquarters after the Anschluss. And he, because he was so well, he was world famous. And because of Prince Marie Bonaparte and Ernst Jones and incredible pressure, they let him go. Uh, but they asked him to sign a piece of paper saying he hadn't been ill-treated. Do you know what he wrote? I can heartily recommend the Gestapo to everybody. He survived, but his two sisters in their 80s died in Theresienstadt. Now, Hitler wants a Juden-Rhein policy. Historians, many historians take the view that this proved to the Nazis that no foreign power would intervene. You know, if you look at his foreign policy, if you look at the push-pull, if the British, if somebody had intervened at Sudetenland, Hitler could have been stopped in Germany prior to 33. He could have been stopped by outside after 33. Anyway, on the 28th of October, 1938, that's just two and a half weeks before Kristallnacht, 18,000 Jews of Polish origin were forcibly repatriated. When Hitler had created the German Workers' Party Manifesto back in Munich, it was a silly little reactionary fascist party. He'd gone along to it, he'd liked it, he joined it, and he was one of the co-signatories of the manifesto. And one of the clauses was that any Jews who'd come into Germany post-1914 must be expelled immediately, the Ostjuden. Now, he begins to expel the Ostjuden. He takes all their property away, it's confiscated, scenes of appalling cruelty. And what happened was they were then transported in carts, trains to the Polish border. 
it was freezing. I don't know how many of you have visited that part of the world in October, November. I've, I've taught all over that area. It is freezing in the autumn, winter. And they were put up in ramshackle barns. The Germans were shooting one way, the Poles didn't want them in. It took two days before the Polish relief organizations, Jewish relief organizations from Warsaw came down with food. It was a horrible, horrible, evil situation. And it was at this stage that there was a family called the Grinspan family who had a son called Herschel. They managed to get a postcard to Herschel, his family telling him what was happening. And he wanted to focus the world's attention on it. So he went into the German embassy in Paris to the third attache von Rath. Now there's a lot of stories about von Rath, were he and Grinspan involved, but that's irrelevant. It's just a little, you know, if you like a peg of history. But the point is he shoots von Rath, who dies a few days later. And this was the excuse for Kristallnacht. It was, as I said, it was the anniversary of the putsch and it was orchestrated by Goebbels. It was also him jockeying for position in the, in the party. So it shows one act of resistance. This is how the Nazis would operate. So that are the events that led to Kristallnacht. And also to hasten the evacuation of the Jews from Germany and Austria, because this is what they wanted. Remember, it's a Judenrein Reich. An immigration bureau was established in Vienna and in Berlin under the auspices of Adolf Eichmann, the arch bureaucrat, the gray man, the arch functionary. And what is absolutely extraordinary, it's not just about getting them out, it's about stealing the property. So people queuing up. And then pressure. There were good people in Britain, in France, in Belgium. And they did begin to put pressure on Parliament and on the government. There was a government of national unity in Britain. I've already mentioned Oswald Mosley, the fascist, etc. Under this sort of auspices of the very, very dark 30s, there were Quakers. There were some remarkable people in the Houses of Parliament like Eleanor Rathbone, Josiah Wedgwood. There were Jewish MPs like the great Barnett Janner and of course, Sidney Silverman. And they put pressure on the government. They put pressure if the government, if you won't, already they've allowed in thousands, but now there's a stampede after Kristallnacht. And I've spoken to German Jewish friends about this. When did you finally realize it was over? Kristallnacht. This is the stampede now. And in the end, provided the community itself sponsored every one of them, they agreed to take 10,000 children. This, of course, is the famous kinder transport. There were kinder transports organized from into Holland, into France, into Belgium, and about 10,000 children came to this country before, of course, war broke out. But I want to be very cynical about this. You know, Britain prides itself on the kinder transport and what we did. Let's be careful here. Can you imagine the pain of parents having to put their children on trains and the fact that the parents weren't saved either? And the fact that the community itself had to pay for the children. They had to be sponsored to the tune of 50, 50 pounds. So when we hear all this, how can I put it? This is what we did, weren't we wonderful? Well, actually nobody was wonderful because the point about the Nazis is they wanted the Jews out. It's only with the invasion of Russia that the final solution begins. And that's when they go for the wholesale murder. At this stage, Jews were actually allowed out of Germany right up until September 1941. And I don't want to make it completely dark because I've already mentioned MPs, but there were some incredible characters in Europe who were trying to help. There was, of course, Frank Foley. There was, of course, the great Varian Fry. There were, there were good folk. And I guess tonight, 82 years ago, when we commemorate the murders, we commemorate the horror. 
I think in memory of those we die, who have died, what we really should be thinking about is how on earth can we change our behaviour that we do invest in each other? Because surely that's what it's all about. These people could have been saved. So consequently, we commemorate. I must tell you, when I first started teaching, and I've been teaching Jewish history for nearly 40 years, I was far more optimistic. But the more I teach and the more I study and the more the dark forces gather, although I think there are chinks in the armour at the moment, I must say, and of course this period of COVID is very bad, but it is polarising society. All I'm saying is that I think we have to be very, very careful in our treatment of each other. And please, let's recognise the humanity in each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trudy. Um, I think the only way we can end that is to play some of Gemma's beautiful music again. So let's, let's do that. A minute. Thank you again, Trudy. Um, what can I say? It's uh, 
it's not a celebration it is a commemoration and you've done it beautifully for us so thank you so much thank and thank you, you again for thank you again to genesis uh, for their support and thank you all for coming and for listening and for as trudy said remembering and taking this forward and doing your bit in um, making sure this is never forgotten uh, we look forward to seeing you again at uh, Trudy will be teaching again on Wednesday morning and our other events, both um, um, more celebratory and more commemoratively. Mm -hmm. And please all take care and look after yourselves. Trudy, thank you. God bless. Be well.